going to introduce a man who needs no introduction, <laughs> uh, David uh, Grinspoon. So Dave, go, please take it. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, I thought it would be interesting to um, continue the discussion with a little bit of focus on planetary evolution and how um, the arrival of a global technological civilization, if that's what we have here on Earth, um, fits into the long story of planetary evolution and then how we might extrapolate that to thinking about planets elsewhere and uh, this stage, if that's what it is, um, arriving on those planets and how that might be observable. Uh, by the way, we're, uh, I thought I'd mention a somber anniversary tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of um, the first um, explosion of a nuclear warhead um, in, warf in uh, warfare uh, at Hiroshima. And um, I think that's uh, relevant um, for this conference in the sense that um, certainly the early founders of SETI were very aware of um, the danger of nuclear war as something that they saw as potentially limiting lifetimes, longevity, not just here, but elsewhere. Um, and uh, in a certain sense, if we're talking about finding long-term civilizations, the fact that we're still armed to the teeth with weapons that are much more powerful than this one, um, in a certain sense indicates that what we seek is not what we are, but perhaps what we aspire to be as far as a uh, stable long-term civilization. Um, certainly um, these founders, these brilliant white dudes who um, started our field in the um, 60s and 1970s, uh, we're very aware of the um, threat of nuclear war, uh, and they spoke about it. They even spoke about trying to find the gamma ray flashes of nuclear wars elsewhere. It was, for understandable reasons, very much on their mind during the Cold War. In a certain sense, it's become almost a quaint concern, but that's just perhaps lack of imagination or cognitive bias of not wanting to deal with the fact that uh, we still live with this threat. However, there are threats that have emerged since then to uh, demand our awareness. Um, certainly, uh, there are other reasons why we could look at our current situation on Earth and say we have not yet achieve that long-term sustainable planetary civilization, which is uh, something that we perhaps seek elsewhere. And, you know, as we've been discussing, longevity is very much related to observability. So um, self-imposed threats uh, could be one thing that, that limits that. So again, this, uh, you could look at this and argue that we are, what we seek is not what we are, but what we aspire to be. This growing realization that we have become a planet changing force and in really a geological force um, has been given the name of uh, the, the Anthropocene Epoch. And I, I won't belabor this, you've seen things like this, but certainly if you look at, if you compile all kinds of data on human influence on the earth, there's a functional similarity here where everything kind of goes along and then around the 1950s starts shooting up in a period of time that's often referred to as the Great Acceleration. Um, so, you know, just in terms of the quantitative argument, there's no doubt that humans have become a force, a, a geological force, um, greater uh, in power in many ways than the, the longstanding geological forces, just in terms of our, uh, how much stuff we move around and our effect on the, the carbon cycle and the sulfur cycle and the nitrogen cycle and the hydrological cycle, all this stuff. Um, you can pretty much make a good argument for that. When did the Anthropocene start? It doesn't really matter on the geological cosmic timescales we're talking about, but I have uh, made my own suggestion, which is that um, it starts with the golden spike of tranquility base. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I want to talk about... Um, the way this concept dovetails with some of what we've been talking about in this meeting. Astrobiology is interesting for the, uh, or, or astrobiology uh, should have an interest in the Anthropocene for many reasons, which I've 
listed here, but I draw your attention to the bottom bullet here that uh, this arguably marks a branching point in planetary history, which may have analogs elsewhere in the galaxy and may determine what we observe on some exoplanets and how we interpret what we observe and perhaps affect our observational strategies. Uh, you could also say that the Anthropocene is perhaps the time when Earth first develops its own observable techno signatures. Now, I've also proposed the idea that this may be the start of a new eon, which is a rather audacious thing to propose. If you look in the upper right of this chart, um, the Anthropocene is usually proposed as a new epoch that comes after uh, the Holocene, which we're supposedly in, which has been lasting about 12,000 years now. Um, and that, you know, in, in many ways, that's a much more defensible claim that we may have um, entered a new eon, but why would I say, why would I propose such a uh, ridiculous thing? Well, it might be fruitful for SETI to think of um, the phenomenon of intelligence as not just the appearance of a civilization on, on a planet, but a transition in planetary evolution. Um, and I'm arguing that this could be called the sapiozoic eon in which cognitive processes become deeply integrated into planetary functioning. Now, can intelligence and technology become a long-term stable part of a planetary system? Um, this leads to a uh, concept of uh, planetary intelligence, which um, I've played around with a bit and which recently uh, Adam Frank and Sarah Walker and I have, along with some other colleagues, have been discussing as a concept that might be worth uh, developing in, in different ways. Thinking of this as not merely something that happens on a planet, but something that happens to a planet. In other words, maybe the Earth has sort of entered a new state, and this could be like uh, an analogy to Gaia, um, where biology, uh, biosphere is something that a planet becomes, not just something that happens on a planet. Maybe we could say something similar about a certain stage of um, intelligence or technological intelligence. So looking again at this um, for a second at this geological um, time scale, again, the upper right is where the Anthropocene is proposed. But I, I wanna point something out that in terms of astrobiology, it's the eons that are most really of interest in the sense that all these epochs and periods are just fluctuations on earth that shouldn't have any counterpart elsewhere. They're uh, climate changes and random extinctions and sort of the fluctuations of a complex evolving planet. But the eons on the left of which there have supposedly only been four, these are major transitions in the nature of the planet, which arguably could have counterparts on other planets not the exact same sequence at the exact same time, but, but you can look at these functionally. Each is a, different, is a phase of a different relationship between life and the planet. And those transitions, I think, may have counterparts if you describe them in a certain way. Um, the Hadean, of course, is uh, probably common to rocky planets, a time when you, it, uh, life would not be likely because the surface was so unstable due to late effects of accretion. Um, the Archean is when life first appeared roughly 4 billion years ago. We don't know the specific time scale. Um, and arguably the Proterozoic is when life sort of took over the planet chemically um, two and a half billion years ago with the rise of oxygen. And uh, if life was not firmly embedded in geochemical cycles to turn them into biogeochemical cycles before that time, it, by the Proterozoic, it certainly was. Life was a uh, integral part of the functioning of the planetary system. The Phanerozoic, of course, is when life got uh, complex and multicellular and then I'm arguing that in terms of this kind of functional transition that a planet could undergo a sapiozoic if cognitive life could become a stable long-term part of the functioning of the planet, that it's as different in a way as, um, as the origin of life or some of these other transitions. So um, let me say a little bit more about that. Um, you know, the real question is, could intelligence like life become a planetary property? What would it take for an uh, intelligent civilization to really be the beginning of a sapiozoic eon? Well, it requires cognitive processes to become a long-term stable part of a planet. And that certainly implies a very different behavioral mode than is currently being exhibited by intelligent life. 
uh, or from a systems perspective, the early stages of this transition, I would argue, are always going to be highly unstable because global influence precedes global control and thus is characterized by positive feedbacks uh, represented here by runaway climate change, um, which hopefully the negative feedback of awareness of those effects will ultimately um, lead to a, shape, a curve that's shaped different from the current Keeling curve. Certainly conscious awareness and control can also, can also be sources of stabilizing negative feedback. And the ozone layer is an example of this. We saw what we were doing, that awareness led to ultimately after um, long uh, period of debate and all kinds of shenanigans, but ultimately it led to um, a uh, glo change in global behavior that came about as a result of that awareness. That's a stabilizing negative feedback. So um, I would argue you could, you could, I have argued that you could divide then in these periods into the proto-Anthropocene, which is where we've been mostly, dominated by inadvertent global changes, to what might be considered a mature Anthropocene dominated by self-aware global change, which really um, would be or is, to the extent it exists, a completely new phenomenon on this planet. Um, awareness is the source of stabilizing feedbacks, and if we um, graduate to a mature Anthropocene, we might ask, could this be the beginning of a sapiozoic eon? Um, now, relating this to some of our, our current dilemmas, uh, there's this idea that Martin Rees and E.O. Wilson and some other smart people have proposed that we may be entering a sort of 21st century bottleneck where a lot of our uh, technological expansion is reaching the point where it will either be self-limiting or uh, become an aperture to um, great survival, to great longevity if we sort of get a handle on ourselves um, more. And, and this could lead to potentially to a bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations. Um, and then this leads to the interesting question of can technology facilitate as well as threaten longevity and could there be a possibility of quasi immortal civilizations where you have deep understanding of nature and deep understanding of self and the ability to forestall natural disasters and ultimately spread beyond um, one planet even one star system um, and if this is possible even at a low probability for a civilization at our stage then even if most civilizations are doomed to self-destruct um, you can ask what are the, what's the consequence of some small fraction could make the transitions. And it's very interesting. So over on the left here is my sort of cartoon of, and this um, relates to the conversations we've already had um, uh, about the distribution of longevities. And maybe you have a Gaussian, but as was pointed out, the long tail of that Gaussian could be significant because it could transition into something quite different. Um, and then L doesn't really have any meaning if L is the average length of a civilization, if a civilization becomes quasi immortal. Um, but it's worth pointing out, and um, uh, Jason Wright has given me some good pushback on this, that, that in most doomsday, doomsday scenarios, humanity doesn't go extinct. And you can argue that by nature, we are civilization builders. So it could be that once civilization gets started or gets to a certain point, um, then civilization, like life, can become a permanent or intermittent planetary feature, regardless of, you know, even if these threats happen, maybe it's sort of a, just a temporary setback if, if our nature is to rebuild and build civilizations. And one could even ask, are, are, are we already at that point? Maybe this is already a sort of permanent feature of Earth. Even if we blow it, we won't, probably won't wipe all of, out all of humanity and there'll be um, rebuilding. And, you know, we've all read all these science fiction stories about that phase, so I won't belabor it now. But um, you could even turn this around and ask, is it possible or even likely that global techn technical civilization, once it exists on a planet, will not disappear or not disappear for long? Maybe the likely answer is that once it's here, it stays here, um, despite setbacks. A at any rate, if you admit the possibility of immortal civilizations, even if it's a low, poss low probability that any given Civil, any civilization on this Gaussian, most of them may die out young, but if any of them, if some tiny fraction make it to this uh, immortal stage, then civilizations are, are like vampires. Once they, once they get turned, then they, they, they live forever and the number accumulates. And therefore the Drake equation uh, does not actually uh, work in that it's, the Drake equation assumes a steady state, that, the, um, that there is an average lifetime because the, uh, there's uh, a rate 
at which uh, civilizations are formed and ultimately the rate is the same as, as the rate at which they, they die over some lifetime. But if, if they really can be immortal, then you, ha you would actually go to a time dependent solution. You're not in a steady state. And uh, like on the lower left here, uh, civilizations would accumulate. And I, I drew the straight line here, but then also we had this brief conversation um, yesterday about um, the possibility of a phase transition. And certainly, if some of the long-lived civilizations decide to help some of the, uh, the other ones lower over on the Gaussian on the left to become immortal, and again, I've, I've worked this out on a napkin and I probably should do the math and publish it, but um, uh, I mean, I've, I've done the math on napkins and it works, but, but um, you know, you just do some, uh, some differential equations and you get that, um, you basically get a phase transition where um, at some point the universe goes from very sparse civilizations to sort of being permeated, um, which is a pretty wild idea, um, but it's possible. Um, certainly if the transition is small but finite, then the universe must be increasingly permeated with intelligence. And this is true even if most civilizations don't make it. And therefore, th there's a common, I think, fallacy a lot of people make, uh, certainly in the general public and maybe even in our community, that L, the average lifetime of civilizations in the universe, is somehow related or closely related to our future longevity of our civilization. And this model, this analysis shows that it's not, because even if any given civilization is more likely to be on the low part of the Gaussian, it still would mean that the universe could be increasingly permeated with um, long-lived civilizations. Well, what might be the properties of these very long-lived or immortal civilizations? Um, of course, no one knows, but it's interesting to speculate. Um, you know, if technological intelligence can exist for geological or cosmic timescales, then even a million year civilization might be quite young, which is sobering because again, you know, we've been talking about million year civilization as like this, you know, very difficult to predict, but worthwhile to try to predict super long time scale. And this just gets at the disconnect between um, the geological time scales and our own experiential and even civilizational and even species time scale uh, is, is short um, on, 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 on those planetary time scales. Uh, and that's one of the values of thinking of the Anthropocene and thinking of ourselves as a geological force is that it sort of puts in our face that, um, that disconnect of time scales. Well, you know, these guys uh, thought about that. Um, and I think some of their ideas are still very much sort of entrenched in SETI. Uh, it's interesting that when these meetings were first held on, I'm thinking of here of Bayurikon, um, two, which is, this is the, the book is the proceedings, um, a really good read if you haven't um, read it. Uh, it's got all the transcript of the discussions in addition to the talks. And um, these meetings were held in the full flush of the great acceleration. And just as an example, here's the 10 largest dams in the United States. And more than half of them were built within a few years of Bayurikon two. This was a time period when we were still seeing um, success and progress as taming the earth. And in fact, two of the people at Bayurikon, um, Phil Morrison and uh, who is this historian, uh, William, um, anyways, the historian there. In their um, remarks, oh, McNeil, Bill McNeil. Uh, and both two of the people in their remarks about Bayurikan remarked how great it was that the, this area of, um, of Armenia was finally uh, being civilized by this new dam that had been built. Um, and, you know, it was just sort of in the culture of even, you know, people that consider themselves very enlightened. They were worried about nuclear war. They weren't worried about really humans overrunning the earth and um, they were still thinking of progress in a certain way. And I, I think that that um, influenced the way we think. And there's what I call the inevitable expansion fallacy, which is enshrined in the Kardashev scale, which is really based on an engineer's view of human history, where the most quantifiable and predictable quality increases in energy use is seen as progress. And that leads to the idea that uh, the more, quote, advanced a civilization is, the more of the universe's energy it will use up. Um, or I paraphrase this as intelligent civilizations 
do not act intelligently <laughs> because um, one can easily um, show not just on our planet, but on longer time scales, on, on, on longer, on wider spatial scales, that this is not a recipe for longevity. Um, and an alternative, and this, uh, um, Jacob Hakmizra and Seth Baum wrote a paper about this and several people have discussed it, that, um, that uh, certainly applying what we're learning on earth now, that longevity will require recognizing limits and integrating gracefully into, the, into nature rather than just subduing it. Um, and um, the nature of long-lived societies may be to develop an ethic of sustainability and perhaps it's not in their nature to, um, uh, to expand relentlessly. And this may even help to explain the Fermi paradox because maybe uh, they're not all out there um, just using up as much energy and radiating uh, energy wastefully the way we um, think they should be. <laughs> um, and, and this also, you know, again, thinking about ourselves, you, you can, we can ask, is there an intelligent civilization on earth today? We often talk about other advanced civilizations, assuming that we are one, or we, we talk about how maybe humans have formed the first advanced civilization in the galaxy. We inherently use language to describe ourselves as an advanced civilization. Um, and in, Drake, in the Drake equation, we sort of talk about what is the longevity of our type of civilization? And yet, um, it's arguable that, that intelligence has not arrived on Earth in the way that may be meaningful uh, in the universe. What we have now might be considered proto-intelligence. Um, it makes sense to not doom yourselves. It's pragmatic in terms of detectability. Um, it's not enough to be able to build a radio telescope. You need to be able to broadcast or listen for centuries. Um, so maybe proto-intelligence is to technological civilization as life is to a biosphere, a prerequisite that may or may not become a robust, robust sustainable global entity. So look at this way, we can see, we can think of a series of gateways where young rocky planets um, maybe form biospheres, maybe Venus and Earth all formed early life, but maybe um, they may or may not pass a gateway where it, life becomes globally entrenched um, and basically you have a Gaia born. And then there may be another gateway where sometimes life becomes complex and intelligent and maybe another gateway where that becomes a long lived sustainable part of the planet. So looked at this way, there could be three types of exoplanets, dead, living, and sapient. Now, what would some of the qualities be that would, might be observable? Um, of uh, other civilizations or planetary civilizations, stable, long-lived planetary civilizations. Of course, nobody knows, and I'm criticizing um, the value of expansion, and now I'm going to uh, propose another value, and it ought to be done with all humility that, uh, you know, we can't really second guess the aliens, but I think there's an argument to be made that they may value stability. And furthermore, I think there's an argument to be made that life will always evolve best on planets that are inherently unstable in the sense that on the surface of the earth, we live in the transition between two huge heat engines, the internal heat engine um, of plate tectonics and the external heat engine of the solar driven weather. And it's the combination of those two kinds of activity that uh, makes earth so fertile, but also um, makes it very prone to natural disasters. And I think that could be something that is always true. So what would a civilization that values stability uh, look like? Well, some possible signs of managed planets, uh, anomalous or artificially stable climate states, dampened and Milankovitch cycles. And the second one I think is really interesting, the preservation of climate states from earlier stages of stellar evolution. The habitable zone moves out, but maybe um, somebody, a uh, civilization already living on a planet wants to keep their climate the way it is. So sort of suspiciously cool planets that look like they've been left behind by stellar evolution. Or ha as has been mentioned, multiple identical climates in a system due to terraforming would be an interesting thing um, to notice. Um, Certainly, I'm gonna wrap up now. In order for our civilization to survive, it's clear that we need to become a different kind of entity on this planet. We need to learn to live comfortably over the long haul with technology that, that can change the world. And seen in this way, a central question of SETI may be the same as the central challenge facing our own civilization. Namely, is it possible for a global technical civilization to form a long-term healthy relationship with a planet? Um, and, with this inspirational quote 
from Rumi about how we have to go through a thousand different worlds yet, or a hundred different worlds yet, there are a thousand forms of mind. I will stop. Thank you very much.